सो हेलो एवरी वन द फिजिक्स सोसायटी ऑफ आयसर तिरुवनंतपुरम और साई ऑफ टी वॉज फाउंडेड इन जानेवरी ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी एज अ स्टूडेंट रन अकेडमिक क्लब अंडर द स्कूल ऑफ फिजिक्स सिंस देन वी हैव ऑर्गेनाइज वेरियस एक्टिविटीज थ्रू आउट द इयर इंक्लूडिंग पीयर डिस्कशन टॉक सीरीज मेंटरशिप सेशंस डॉक्यूमेंट्री स्क्रीनिंग्स एंड ऑनलाइन क्विजेस वी वुड लाइक टू टेक दिस मोमेंट टू थैंक प्रोफेसर आर सी नाथ एंड डॉक्टर सोमू कुमार गुरुबरन who helped us out in the starting phases of the club with their wise inputs dr joy mitra the head of department of the school of physics dr vinay kamle and dr manik panik the faculty coordinators who have helped us organize multiple different events and to all the members of the physics department for their constant support and enthusiasm we would also like to thank all of you for your ever increasing support which motivates us to keep moving forward to mark the anniversary of the foundation of the club we are celebrating this week as the society foundation week in which we have organized different webinars and contests starting with the first talk by professor sunil mukhi so moving on ravi yeah mr sunil mukhi dr sunil mukhi is a well known person in the field of physics and uh, he got his phd from in theoretical physics from stony brook university and then he spent some years at a post doctoral fellow at international center for theoretical physics at italy and after which he returned to india and worked in tifr from 1984 to 2012 in 2012 he joined icer pune and uh, he is now currently a dean at at the institute and his research deals mainly with the uh, physics of elementary particles uh, specifically the string theory and the quantum field theory and professor mukhi is a fellow of indian academy of sciences indian national science academy and the world academy of sciences and he is also a recipient of a ss bhatnagar award in 1999 he has been editor of the journal of high energy physics since 1997 and in addition to physics he has a various interests like classical music science popularization writing newspaper articles cinema co and meditation which can be seen on his web page so i would like to thank dr sunil mukhi for accepting our invitation and being here today on this for this talk over to you sir thank you very much uh, it's a honor to be invited for this uh, first talk it seems in your series uh, can you see my screen properly now yeah it's as well clear very good okay so i'll start my talk so uh, i'm very happy uh, to give this talk and i'm happy you're all here what i'll do is uh, you know it's planned as a i actually i don't remember if organizers told me how long it should be um <clears throat> it's planned for about maybe 45 50 maybe 55 minutes if you want it shorter it can be shorter uh, but i'll pause in between organizers is that okay roughly one hour is okay Yeah, sure. So we plan for the same forty-five minutes and a short question and answer session after that. Okay. So one of the sections I may skip just to keep it in time, but uh, I will pause in between sections so that there can be questions because it's always good if uh, you know this is not a technical talk. This is a popular level talk, and I would like uh, to hear your questions. Also, at the end, I'll be available for questions. Very good. So the title of my talk is Mathematical Physics and Reality. and i'll try to ask the question that are these two different things uh, or are they uh, connected how well connected is mathematical physics to reality so uh, let me start by showing you a few quotes by famous people i think you can recognize the people uh, since you are the physics uh, uh, club or society i don't think i need to name uh, these uh, people you see in the photos so this guy said the laws of nature are written in the language of mathematics but he was himself a legendary experimentalist this one uh, said it's a miracle that in spite of the baffling complexity of the world certain regularities can be discovered this one said the only physical theories we are willing to accept are beautiful ones and this one says mathematics plays a more sovereign role in physics and uh, these this kind of sets a little bit the theme of my talk uh, a lot of very important uh, very very major physicists of the last century and of many centuries before that 
uh, felt that a mathematical formulation is something very important to understand the laws of nature. Now, the last 120 years, the start of the 20th century, has been an era of sensational experimental discoveries. And let's take a quick look what are the main discoveries. Well, first of all, atomic structure was understood and it created two new fields soon after that subatomic and subnuclear physics. Today, subnuclear physics is called particle physics. So, subatomic is what does what is the atom made of, and subnuclear physics is about what is the nucleus made of, made of. Now, in a completely different direction, astronomers learned, and this is really more, uh, this has been solidified in this century, the 21st century, uh, in the last uh, decade or 15 years, that black holes are among the most common objects in the universe. And uh, you'll be surprised to know maybe that up until the 1970s or 80s, people weren't sure that there's even one. And now uh, it's pretty clear that the universe has more black holes than pretty much anything else. Now, in a totally different direction of physics, uh, the physics of materials was changed forever with the discovery of semiconductors and superconductors. And recently, new other new kinds of materials called topological materials. Now, what do these three different types of discoveries have in common? Apparently, nothing. Uh, but we'll see that all of them rely in some ways or way or others, uh, in some way or other, uh, and especially in their modern version, they rely on quite uh, serious level of mathematics. Now, during this period, those were the experimental discoveries. Here are the theoretical discoveries. Quantum mechanics is a formalism, you all know. Special relativity, another formalism. It applies when objects move very fast. Quantum mechanics applies when objects are very small. General relativity applies when the effect of gravity is very important. Uh, many body or quantum field theory is a synthesis of the first two things in this line, quantum mechanics and special relativity. And we absolutely need it to describe particle physics. So these theories originated not because of any mathematician or any desire to do mathematics, but because they were experimental facts and they needed to be explained. However, it turns out that the underlying mathematical structure is so deep, so profound, so strong, that it constrains what is possible in nature. And this we find very strange at first, that the structure of theories tells us uh, what experiments should or should not, uh, should not give rise to. Now, you can always ask, well, what if an experiment gives a result that my class of theories doesn't allow? It could happen. Of course, it could always happen. It could happen tomorrow. But the fact is that it hasn't happened. Experiments haven't done that. And this gives us confidence that the broad structure, which I'm showing here, of quantum mechanics, special relativity, general relativity, and quantum field theory are very, very deep guides to the workings of nature. Good. Now, I'm not the first to point this out. In 1959, Eugene Wigner, uh, who I actually had the privilege to, to meet at a, a summer school in 1982, I think it was, uh, um, wrote this article in 59 called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics uh, in the Natural Sciences. And uh, well, you can see from his title, uh, of course, we expect mathematics to be relevant, but he pointed out that it's more than relevant, it's effective beyond what we might expect. And physics today has moved much beyond what even Wigner knew about. And in this talk, I'll try to show you a kind of uh, modern or updated version of what he was talking about. Namely, mathematical considerations have led to predictions of real world phenomena, those which you can actually measure and which have been measured over a wide range of sub areas of physics. Uh, and these are some of the examples, the existence of antiparticles, uh, the existence of topological materials, the physics of hadrons and quarks, the physics of what we call weak bosons and, and, and the Higgs particle, which includes the Higgs particle, and the physics of black holes. Now, you may note that different people work on these different types of physics, 
and very often don't talk much to each other. Uh, what's really nice is that mathematical physics seems to be some underlying glue which holds these different parts of physics really together. There are many other examples which I won't get to in this talk and even I think weak bosons which is very interesting and it's about the Higgs mechanism and the Higgs particle and you've surely, surely heard of that. I'll probably have to skip that section. Anyway, so after I try to review these historic facts, I'll share some of my own thoughts on the subject. Good, let's start with antiparticles. Now, uh, you're all physics students, if I understood right. And uh, in physics, in quantum mechanics, we use an equation called the Schrodinger equation to describe the wave function of particles. And here is a way of writing it. I think I got this from a paper, from the paper of Schrodinger, actually. Uh, it can be, the, the form that you're familiar with can be rewritten in this way. Normally, we write it h bar squared over 2m with a minus sign and all that, but a little fiddling and you'll get this form. Now, uh, this is the, of course, the time independent Schrodinger equation. It has energy eigenvalues E, as you see here. And this uh, is the Laplacian on space. But such an equation is not compatible with the special theory of relativity, which treats space and time on the same footing. Therefore, this equation can't be right. It may describe quantum particles only as long as those particles are not moving close to the speed of light. Now, there's a mathematical way of saying it, which is that uh, relativity is associated to a symmetry group called the Lorentz group, which is mathematically known as the group SO3, one special orthogonal group of three space and one time dimension, roughly. And that's not a symmetry of this equation. So looking at this equation, you can immediately rule out that it's correct when uh, relativistic physics holds, because this symmetry group must actually be satisfied by any valid equation in the relativistic domain. Now, Dirac looked at this problem in 1928, and he proposed a different equation, which is not this one of Schrodinger, but which is compatible with SO3, one symmetry. Dirac understood mathematics very well. In fact, he started life, I think, in mathematics. And, uh, but he turned his attention to physics problems, and he wrote this paper in 1928. Here's a picture of Dirac uh, when you visited India, actually, much later, I think 1950s probably. Uh, he's with here with Purnima Sinha, one of the first uh, Indian uh, women physicists. Uh, and I think he visited Kolkata. I'm not sure if he traveled elsewhere in India at the time. Anyway, that's a digression. So here from Dirac's paper is a kind of snapshot of his equation, and it looks a little bit different. It does have P0 and P, these are the energy and momentum of the particle. Uh, and these will be quantum operators, just like in the Schrodinger equation. But the Schrodinger equation only has P, it doesn't really have P0 as an operator. And here it's looking a little bit different, and it's really a different equation. It also has the speed of light in it, which Schrodinger's equation doesn't have. And it also has some matrices, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, you may have heard of them. These are the Pauli matrices. Anyway, it doesn't matter if you know this equation or not, or you know this notation or not. The important thing is that it's a different wave equation from Schrodinger's. Okay. Now, once you have the equation, Dirac proposed it based on a mathematical principle uh, and said, well, let me try to find its solutions. And he found them, and he found that it predicts two types of quantum states. Uh, of which one half of the states have positive energy, but the other ones mathematically have negative energy. And this is very disturbing because uh, negative energy is a strange concept in physics and moreover, uh, it's unbounded. So you can have as large negative energy as you like. So then there's low, no lowest energy at all. So here's a picture of the states. Each X is a quantum state. I've put two, each, uh, two X's in each level because we can have electrons with a spin up and a spin down, uh, and they're allowed by the Pauli exclusion principle. And so X means empty. So right now I haven't filled them. These are empty states. But the point is that there are empty states going all the way down here, all the way to minus infinity, as well as all the way up here. This is not so surprising, but the negative energy states are surprising. So Dirac thought about this, and actually thought about it for some time, for a couple of years and wrote another paper where he proposed that the negative energy states are already filled. 
somehow nature gives us a vacuum in which the negative energy states are already full of electrons. And uh, now, because of again Pauli exclusion, you can't put any more electrons uh, over here because the state is filled and exclusion doesn't allow anything more to be added. So any electron you add to this system will populate one of these states and that corresponds to reasonable type of physics as we know it. So in this way, you seem to get rid of the negative energy states, but you get rid of them only temporarily as we'll see in a second. There can be transitions where an electron moves from a negative to a positive energy state if you give it enough energy and it will leave behind a hole. So in this picture, imagine there was a circle over here which was an electron filling this negative energy state and it moved up here. So leaving this state empty at the end and now we have one electron here. But we also have this empty state in what Dirac had proposed to be filled. In fact, it was called Dirac's C, C as in, as in the, the, the C, Samundar in Hindi. Uh, I don't know what it is in Malayalam, sorry. Um, and Dirac C, which was supposed to be full, suddenly develops a hole in it and the uh, set of positive energy states develop an electron. Now, the electron is fine, but the hole, being the absence of an electron, behaves like a positive energy uh, particle because it's the absence of a negative energy electron. So, if you remove a negative energy electron from a system, whatever is left has positive energy. And Dirac said, well, this thing will behave like another particle and there's no reason why this one and this one should sit in space together. They could fly apart. Okay, they have some energy, so they could just, you know, go wherever they go. But <clears throat> this thing would effectively be another type of particle, uh, and he called it the anti electron or positron, and it's a particle that had never been seen in any experiment before this. One thing this picture tells us is that electrons and positrons have to be created in pairs. When an electron is created by moving this one from here up to here, the hole is also another particle, that's the positron. So the system was charged neutral before uh, because we defined the zero of charge when the C is already filled. And now uh, there's one new particle of negative charge here and a new particle of positive charge here. So it's again neutral, but it has an electron and positron pair. What you have to appreciate is that he proposed an actual new particle which had never been seen. That's quite shocking and it sounds like a mathematical fantasy. First you say they are negative energy states because of mathematics, then you say they must be filled, then you say that well there can be a transition where it gets emptied, the hole behaves like a particle. It all sounds uh, quite shady and it's nothing to do with anything uh, done in the laboratory. But luckily for Dirac, Carl Anderson was studying cosmic rays at about this time. So remember, Dirac's first paper was in 1928. Second one was, I think, 1931. And in 1932, Anderson discovered uh, a particle which was exactly the positron. It had a positive charge. It had the mass predicted by Dirac. And it had all properties predicted by Dirac. And since then, we have learned that antimatter is a real thing. Uh, we know anti-muons, we know of anti-quarks, we know of anti-neutrinos, pretty much everything has an antiparticle. There are some exceptions, but the antiparticle will see may or may not be the best explanation today. We have something better in quantum field theory, but whatever it is, in this way, he predicted antimatter and it turned out true. So I'll pause here. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to address them. Is the hole same as that hole uh, that came in the semiconductor zone? Sorry, can you speak a little louder? Sir, is the hole same as that, mm -hmm. that hole in semiconductor? Very good. Good question. I understood it. Is the hole the same as the hole in semiconductor? Not exactly the same, but very similar. And actually, what we see here is that you know mechanisms in physics can work in many different contexts. What happens in semiconductor? is that because of having some material and some doping, uh, you can have a site vacated by an electron and there's nothing there. Now, in that hole in semiconductors, it's not a positron, it's just a hole. It's actually a material. So the material is supposed to be full of electrons. If the electron is missing, that's a hole. 
In Dirac's case, he actually went much further. He said that the vacuum of nature, empty space, empty space with nothing in it, is really full of negative energy states which are populated. And if I pull out an electron from that, the hole that is left is a fundamental particle. So the difference is that uh, in, in condensed matter, the hole that's left when an electron moves out is a real hole in a material, while here it's some kind of mathematical hole in the vacuum. Okay, uh, But the mathematics of the two systems has a lot of similarities. In particular, even in semiconductors, we apply some voltage or give some energy to create an electron hole pair. In semiconductors, that's also true. Yeah. Any more questions? But this yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sir, can you move back one slide back? Sure. This one? Sir, this this experiment of like electron 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 pair production, like how can we like find like from from where where it produces and where it ends from this picture on the left? What so this left? picture actually doesn't do pair production because nature has uh -huh. done it for us. So the point is that cosmic rays, as you know, cosmic rays are showers of particles which come to the earth from elsewhere. We don't distinguish where they come from. Different parts of them come from uh, different places, hmm? from our galaxy, from others, from far away, from not so far away. Now, the point is that when cosmic rays strike the atmosphere of the Earth, hmm, then the uh, light or, uh, or, well, what happens is that in the upper atmosphere, processes take place where the atmosphere interacts with incoming particles. They may be particles of light, they may be particles of matter. And in that process, electrons and positrons would be created in pairs. But all we are seeing are the cosmic rays when they reach the Earth. So just the fact that we detect positrons in them shows us that they exist. It doesn't show us that positrons and electrons are produced in pairs. Because if they were produced in a pair, the electron could have gone somewhere else and the positron would have reached us. Hmm? Because these are processes with a lot of scattering in the upper atmosphere. And there's no guarantee that both the electron and positron of a pair will reach us together. After Anderson, because positrons exist, people tested the remaining part of Dirac's theory, namely, are they produced in pairs? And they found that they are. So that was done later. Very good. But, but, but this, this experiment is also done in the lab, right? No? Yes. Now it can be done in the lab. I'm not sure what's the easiest way. Uh, I don't think I've done this when I did a lab. But uh, so, but basically, uh, if, you, if you can accelerate a light, if you can uh, sort of make a light beam interact with matter in such a way that it acquires a certain amount of energy, uh, then it can, uh, uh, so you actually what you could do is collide two light beams, okay. Now ordinary light beams won't do because they don't have enough energy, but I think if with lasers, it should not be a problem to create particle antiparticle pairs. So basically the process is that two photons interact and give an electron and positron. Okay, thank you. Those were good questions. No, I'll move I have on. a question, yeah. sir. Sorry, uh, yeah. yeah, in case of uh, condensed matter holes, so it is just relative movement of the electrons and uh, it doesn't have any uh, violation of mass conservation actually. So, but this time it is like uh, mass coming out of vacuum states, right? Because Yeah, but it's not, you see, yeah, that's true, but it's not mass coming out of vacuum because this transition won't happen unless you provide energy to the system. And as you know, in relativity, energy and mass are the same thing. So by providing energy, we can create two particles uh, of a non-zero mass. So okay. you may say that mass is violated, but combination of mass and energy is conserved. But you're perfectly right. In condensed matter, even mass is not violated. That's correct. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Now, after antiparticles were discovered, it was believed that all fermions have antiparticles. For example, I told you electrons have, muons have, neutrinos have. But in 1937, this very interesting character called Majorana proposed that there might be uh, some fermions uh, which are their own antiparticles. Now, this could be true only if they are neutral because antiparticle always has opposite electric charge from the particle. So maybe some neutrinos could have been or maybe some unknown particles, some unknown fermions could be their own uh, antiparticles. He didn't just propose it. He actually uh, modified Dirac's equation to allow for such things. Okay. And he said, and so 
till today, uh, fermions which are neutral and which are their own antiparticles are called Majorana fermions. They are hypothetical and people have searched for them and people are still searching for them, by the way. But to date, no such elementary particle has been seen. Now, uh, I'm going to list for you two or three different theoretical proposals, which completely I'll show you that they completely failed. And then I'll show you that they actually didn't fail. In 1978, Edward Witten studied hypothetical particles called magnetic monopoles. These have been proposed long ago, in particular by Dirac again. Uh, and in uh, 78, Edward Witten, who was uh, then just a fresh uh, postdoctoral fellow, uh, wrote a very nice short paper pointing out that if CP symmetry, which is a possible symmetry of nature, if it's violated, then monopoles are not really monopoles. They acquire some fractional electric charges. So monopoles should have only magnetic charge. But he showed that in theories where CP symmetry is violated, monopoles become dions. That means they have both magnetic and electric charges. And this effect is called the Witten effect. The fact that in certain class of theories, monopoles become dions. CP is a charge conjugation times parity. It's a symmetry of nature, which we believe is broken in certain ways, but the violation is very small. It's very difficult to detect. Now, nobody has seen a magnetic monopole in nature, nor has anyone seen a dion. So this prediction also was a theoretical idea, which didn't come to fruition in particle physics. Let's give you one more theoretical idea. Frank Wilczek, who actually won a Nobel Prize for something quite different, noticed in 1987 that if certain other hypothetical particles called axions exist, then the laws of electromagnetism get modified with interesting consequences. So this he called axion electrodynamics. Again, it was a kind of theoretical game he was playing uh, involving the laws of electromagnetism and the existence of axions. But to date, no elementary particle called the axion has been seen. So I've shown you three predictions which appeared to fail. One of Majorana fermions, second of dions, and third of axions. Now, these are all very smart people. Majorana, by the way, uh, disappeared at a very young age and was never seen again. His life is a mystery. But these two people you're seeing on the screen have not disappeared. They're very much active and alive and uh, considered among the top physicists in the world. But here are their failed predictions. So were these predictions a waste of time? Were they doing empty mathematical physics with no connection to reality? Turns out, no. All the concepts that I've reviewed for you just now, Majorana fermions, uh, Witten's dions, and axion electrodynamics have all turned out to be true in topological materials. The key property of topological materials is the existence of special surface states. So the bulk of a material and the boundary of a material have different behavior. For example, it can be uh, an insulator in the bulk and it can be conducting in the bound on the boundary. That's called a topological insulator. Here you see a kind of cutaway of an insulator. So on this boundary, the golden part is all conducting. But if I look inside, it's all insulating. Now you see, it's not the same as a insulator on which I stuck some sheet of aluminium outside to make the surface conducting. Because these materials, if I slice it, if I slice this block in two parts, again, the surface will become conducting. You see, it's an intrinsic property of the surface. And it's a single material. Here are some other weird materials where only these lines are conducting or only these points are conducting. So these are called higher order topological insulators. This is the whole subject. And as you can see, this has nothing visibly to do with particle physics. This is something of interest to condensed matter physicists, material scientists, these kinds of people. Now, the analog of dions and axions are actually seen in materials called topological insulators, which I've just described for you. And uh, one of the major papers in this field was published in 2008. Okay, and it's called topological field theory of time reversal invariant insulators. Uh, and what these uh, uh, authors showed was that a certain observable in these insulators called the magnetoelectric polarization in TRI, TRI is top, uh, time reversal invariant topological insulators, 
plays the role of an axion. So it's some kind of excitation in the material which behaves like an axion and it obeys the equations that Wilczek proposed to be the equations of axion electrodynamics. Now, you can make a temporal gradient of this quantity. That means you can make, you can excite the material in a way in which this axion uh, or this polarization has a gradient in time. It's time varying. And this induces an effect called the temporal magnetoelectric effect. Now, when you have a gradient, then of course, time reversal invariance is broken, right? Because if, if some quantity in the material is changing in time, then obviously it could be lower at a later time, uh, greater, higher at an earlier time. Then if I reverse the direction of time, the behavior is not the same. So in this way, I would induce time reversal violation. And in presence of this temporal magnetoelectric effect, these very axions satisfy the Witten formula for dions. So Witten formula works, axion electrodynamics works, only not in nature as a feature of elementary particle physics. As far as we know, it could still be true. There may still be Witten dions in the vacuum, but they haven't been found. But the same mechanism with the same mathematics and the same equations works in topological insulators. And this is a point that I want to emphasize uh, to all of you, because some of you will be interested in particle physics, others of you will be interested in materials physics or condensed matter physics. And the point is that mathematical theory can have applications of the same formalism in both places. Now, I didn't yet uh, tell you what happens with Majorana fermions, but let me anyway show you this uh, uh, picture. Uh, this is from a paper, uh, this is actually from a review uh, published in physics uh, that uh, I just want to quote this sentence. The esoteric concept of axions was born 30 years ago as an attempt to resolve a puzzle in description of strong interactions between quarks. It appears that the same physics, though in a much different context, applies to an unusual class of insulators. So they just wanted to show you. Uh, this is a nice uh, review. If you note down this reference, Physics 1, 38, uh, you should read it. It's a kind of a cover story about this breaking new application of these rules. And it says these developments have propelled axion electrodynamics from an idle curiosity to an experimentally observable reality. In my view, they were never an idle curiosity. They were a curiosity. Uh, but it's not idle, it's not correct to call it idle, it's mathematics, it's mathematical physics. And when good formulae come out of mathematical physics, often, not always, but often, they have some experimental uh, consequence. So now let me talk about topological superconductors. These are different topological materials. And the interesting thing is that in 2018, this is much more recent, it is claimed that Majorana fermions uh, exist uh, as the surface states in a topological superconductor. Okay, so again, topological superconductors are also topological ma materials with different bulk and boundary properties. And the interesting thing is that the boundary properties are proper are well described by Majorana fermions, uh, which again are not elementary particles in nature, but the excitations in this topological material are Majorana in nature, which means they are neutral fermions and they are equivalent to their own antiparticles. In a sense, uh, they are like the analog of electrons, which are the same as holes. The reason electrons and holes in a semiconductor cannot be the same is that electrons have negative charge and holes have positive charge. But here, effectively, the holes and the particles behave the same way. And that's what we call Majorana bound states. And uh, just to show you, uh, an actual experimental graph. I've actually now a bit forgotten what uh, we're supposed to read off from this. Uh, I had read about this some time back when I first prepared this talk. Uh, but the key point I guess I want to emphasize is that these are actual observations in this material. This is an experimental paper uh, which gives evidence uh, in a particular ion-based superconductor of this exotic behavior. But the exotic behavior, according to the authors, uh, fits the prediction of Majorana fermions. Okay, so that's the end of my next section, which is about topological materials. Again, I'll 
I invite questions, but I'll warn you that I'm not an expert on materials, physics, or even topological insulators. So I might not be able to answer everything you ask, but please go ahead. Organizers can say no questions, then I'll go on. Yeah, there seem to be no questions. I can continue. OK, very good. OK, let's move on to a different story. I'm going back and forth in time, as you see. Just now I was talking about stuff that's happening in the last few years. Now I'm back to the 1950s. During this time, many new strongly interacting particles called hadrons were discovered in experiments. <clears throat> the hadrons were always around in nature, but experiments just weren't good enough to find these particles. So the experiments had to have some accelerator which creates them. So you needed something powerful to accelerate electrons or some familiar particles and smash them with each other or smash them on a target. And then you also had to have a detector like a bubble chamber or cloud chamber, or spark chamber, many kinds of detectors were invented at that time, uh, which then uh, could see these particles. But it was a very rich time because, you know, pretty much anyone who had a good experiment running would keep finding new particles. Now, what was not clear about these particles is, were they elementary or were they composite and made up of something else? It was also not clear, why does nature give us so many new particles? So these had never been seen before. These were not part of atomic nucleus. They were not atoms. There was something altogether new. So it was a puzzle and it was a very exciting time. Now here's Murray Gelman, who in 1961, uh, he and Neyman independently uh, proposed a classification scheme for hadrons uh, based on uh, some mathematics, which most physicists did not know, namely the representation theory of the group SU3. And the basic idea, so Gelman called it the eightfold way, a theory of strong interaction symmetry. And he wrote this in 1961, but this is sort of a preprint, it's not really a published paper. And it was circulated in Caltech where he was working and then probably outside as well. And uh, it's called eightfold, by the way, because SU3 uh, is a, technically it's a Lie algebra of dimension eight, okay? Uh, SUN Lie algebra has dimension n squared minus one. So three squared minus one is eight. Uh, but of course, eightfold way is also part of Buddhist philosophy. Bel Gelman was a great reader of uh, cultural, uh, I mean, a great, uh, great, uh, great person, I mean, a very f well, well studied person who had studied many cultures around the world. And he knew something about Buddhism. So he borrowed this title eightfold way to describe his uh, new symmetry of strong interactions. So I've told you this. Good. Now, Lie algebras, uh, of which SU3 is an example, have representations which are mathematically vector spaces on which the symmetries act. And those spaces have some dimension. And uh, let's talk about a few of them. So one of those uh, vector spaces is eight dimensional. It corresponds with the dimension of the algebra. And what uh, Gelman and also Neyman noticed is that if you look at the neutron n over here, the proton p over here, and a bunch of newly discovered particles, sigma minus, sigma plus, sigma zero, psi minus, psi zero, they neatly fit into this representation uh, of the eight dimensional representation of SU3. Now, why I've put it as a hexagon with two particles in the middle and six at the vertices, I, I can't explain, but any mathematician will tell you that the representation theory of the Lie algebra SU3 arises from the fact that SU3 has rank two, that rank is the number of particles in the middle, and it has three positive and three negative roots. Those six roots are illustrated by these uh, six vectors from the origin to these six points. So this is some numerology, it's some property of SU3. And they found that these new particles together with the old particles fit beautifully uh, in terms of certain properties, which include the electric charge, which include isospin, which is a symmetry and strangeness, which is another approximate symmetry. I don't have time to explain these. These are all part of any 
particle physics course. But the beautiful thing was that based on this, uh, they said, well, the fact that all of these fit in one irreducible representation of SU3 should be the reason why their masses are all roughly of a similar order of magnitude in the range from about 940 to 1350 mega electron volts. There's nothing which is 10 times that. All the masses of these are in that range. You know, probably that neutrons and protons are at the lower end. So they said, well, we think of SU3 as an approximate symmetry, and it explains why these particles are approximately equal in mass. Very good. That could have been a coincidence. But in fact, SU3 has many different irreducible representations, and the simplest and best known have dimensions 3, 8, and 10. 3 is the 3 of SU3. 8 is 3 squared minus 1, and 10 comes from a more complicated formula, but all this is in mathematics textbooks. And what Gelman noticed is that many new mesons and baryons, many of these new hadrons that were being discovered, fitted nicely into the 8 and 10 representations, just like the baryons I showed you, but he found some gaps. For example, there were three uh, particles called pions or pi mesons and four particles called k mesons. That makes seven. But seven cannot be an octet. Octet means it should have eight particles. So there should be one representation of SU3 which has eight particles of which three are pions and four are k mesons all known and one more should be there. So I said, well, mathematics must be right. So I predict that there's one more particle with roughly the same mass as pions and k mesons. He was also able, so he called it chi zero, and he was also able to predict that it should decay into two photons. Two gamma here means two photons. Okay. So he predicted a particle and he predicted how it should decay and he predicted roughly what mass it should have. Now, this particle today is known as the eta meson and it was discovered later in the same year and it had exactly the properties that Gelman predicted. But unfortunately, the thing I showed you was a preprint. It was not really published, so it wasn't widely known. So when the eta meson was discovered, not everybody was willing to agree that Gelman had predicted it in advance using mathematics. After it was discovered, probably people said, look, there's this preprint of Gelman. Gelman is a very well-known physicist. We should believe him that he, when he says that he wrote it, it was circulated in Caltech, people have seen it, but it wasn't published. So it wasn't properly acknowledged, but Gelman didn't get discouraged. In 1962, he did it again. In 1962, what he did was he took baryons and he found that they seemed to fit very well into a 10-dimensional representation or decuplet of SU3, except one is missing. He could only, there only nine were known which fitted into that decuplet. And he said, well, it must be a decuplet because nine is bigger than eight. And so it can't be the octet. And these nine, he did some mathematics to see that their properties fitted with this decuplet, which has a certain diagram, I'll show you. But the tenth one is missing. And he said, I predict that there is going to be a tenth baryon. Uh, and he predicted that it will have strangeness number of minus three. It will have electric charge of minus one, like the electron. It will have a mass approximately 1680 MeV. And all this for a particle which nobody had seen. And it was found two years later in 1964. And this time, his prediction was properly published and properly publicized. And when it was found in 64, people were like, OK, it's clear that Gelman predicted this. Now let me show you the diagrams. Both these were Gelman's predictions. In the first one, we have this k-mesons and pions. And there was no eta, so there was only one dot in the center. He wanted a second one, and eta was found in 62. For the decuplet, the mathematical diagram looks like an inverted triangle with 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 particle, total of 10, with predicted charge assignments. And this bottom vertex of the triangle was a particle that was not known. These others, psi star, sigma star, delta, all these were known. All these were experimentally known. Only this was missing. And Gelman said, no, group theory says, if I'm right, uh, and group theory applies, then it says, well, there must be a 10th particle, and it was found. So this was a sensational discovery. 
Now, following this sensational discovery, Gelman made another sensational discovery. He was on a roll in 1960s. He said, well, where's the three-dimensional representation of SU3? SU3 has a three-dimensional representation called the fundamental, but we never saw three particles which fit in that. We only saw particles fitting in octets and decuplets. Something should be in the three-dimensional representation. Now, what he knew of mathematics was that if I take the three-dimensional representation of SU3 and tens take its tensor products with itself, then I can reproduce the octet and the decuplet. So three-dimensional is more basic than the others. The others are tensor products. And Gelman understood that if we are trying to get tensor products, it means that in physics, uh, the octet and decuplet will be bound states of the particles in the three-dimensional representation. So he said, if I predict some particles in the three-dimensional representation, maybe they even explain the existence of the octets, decuplets, and all other particles as their bound sticks. And so in 1964, Gelman and also Zweig independently proposed constituents of hadrons called quarks. Now, people had proposed quarks before, but they didn't, I think, rigorously follow Gelman's SU3 logic. And if you rigorously follow it, you come to the conclusion there should be three quarks, which he called U, D, and S. This is an arbitrary name, up, down, and strange, except that strangeness was a conserved quantum number, and the strange quark, if it was present, would give that number to the bound state. And if it was absent, the bound state would be non-strange. So, for example, protons and neutrons are only made of up and down, so they are non-strange. A simple calculation tells you that in order to reproduce everything you need, the correct electric charges of these new particles should be two-thirds, minus one-third, and minus one-third, and Gelman na named them quarks. Then he argued that, and they should be spin off, uh, they should have a spin one by two, half a unit of spin, and all the baryons will be bound states of three quarks. So uh, by taking half cross half cross half, if you know angular momentum rules, you can get half or you can get three half. Okay, and we know baryons of spin half as well as baryons of spin three half. On the other hand, mesons have integer spin and they can be obtained by taking bound states of a quark and an antiquark. So the whole spectrum of baryons and mesons found by experimentalists simplified uh, dramatically by this discovery. And it also gave new predictions. For example, if I have three quarks called U, D, and S, then uh, making meson bound states, that is uh, quark, anti-quark bound states, I should get nine of them, right? U, D, or S, and then U bar, D bar, or S bar in all possible ways. I get nine particles, but only eight of them make the meson octet. Where's the ninth particle? SU3 group theory says that this set splits into an octet representation and a singlet representation, but it doesn't say both have to occur in nature. It only says if seven of the eight octet appear, then the eighth one must be there. It doesn't say the singlet has to occur, but quark theory goes beyond that and says, well, there are three quarks, so there must be nine bound sticks. And of course, in 1964, the eta prime meson was discovered, and it's exactly the ninth bound state among these quark antiquark pairs. So you see that SU3 group theory really, really paid off a lot. Now, it's a very interesting fact of history, and this I want to emphasize. This is my own commentary on this historic discussion, historical discussion. Both theorists and experimentalists were very skeptical about the quark model. Both groups had, first of all, the same question. If there are quarks, why have we never seen them? The quarks are supposed to have fractional charges. An experiment can easily measure the charge of an elementary particle, and nobody has ever seen fractional charges. Well, in 1968, a very interesting result was found through an experiment. You take an electron and hit it, let's say, on a proton. Okay, what the electron does is to emit a very high energy photon, virtual photon, which penetrates deep inside this hadron and scatters from the constituents of it, if there are constituents. Now, if this hadron is a smooth lump, then the scattering will have a very smooth 
behavior. If this hadron is made of point-like particles called quarks, which is what Gelman predicted, then the scattering should be very sharp. If you know atomic theory, it's the same thing which happens with atoms. Because of atoms, uh, when we do X-ray diffraction, uh, we get backscattering from atoms. So it's the same idea, but taken to one level deeper. And this was confirmed. And so it turns out that there are constituents inside hadrons, but people were still not comfortable with this fancy SU3 mathematics group theory. So Feynman actually gave these things a new name. He said that whatever is inside which are detected by these experiments, I'll call them partrons. Maybe they are quarks, maybe they are not quarks. He actually didn't discuss quarks for a long time. There were many papers describing the experimental behavior of partrons without calling them quarks until finally the obvious thing became true that partrons are quarks. Partrons are what you see in experiment. Quarks are what Gelman and Zweig predicted based on SU3 group theory. And the reason that these quarks or partrons were not seen freely propagating is because they are permanently confined inside these hadrons. So the nature of strong interaction is such that these particles can never get out even in principle. But you can go in or rather you can send a photon inside and it will scatter and it will tell you what's inside. So it's a very peculiar dynamics. Uh, it's like a person living inside a house who never comes out. You might say, does this person exist? Well, you can go to their house and see them, talk with them and come back. But that person will never go out of their house. Does that person exist or not? Obviously, the person does exist, just has the behavior pattern of not going outside the house. And by the way, that's very well understood. It's not something arbitrary like quarks don't feel like going outside uh, their their hadrons. Uh, it's actually now very mathematically well understood that the force between quarks is of confining nature. So as soon as they try to come out, they are pulled back by a very strong force. So that's the history of quarks uh, and the history of SU3 and strong interaction. So again, uh, time for questions if you have any. Sir, even strong uh, nuclear explosion cannot uh, remove quarks, or sir? Yeah, uh, whatever we do, we cannot remove quarks. Uh, the, the point is that if we hit the hadron hard enough to remove a quark, what actually will happen is that the quark will come out, but it will also pull an anti-quark from the vacuum and it will make a new hadron. And the corresponding quark will go back in the nucleon and form a new nucleon. So the funny property of quarks is that they never like to live alone. So what they do is they pair produce quark anti-quark pair so that if you try to pull a quark out, it actually fragments this particle. This red particle could be a proton. So if I hit the proton very hard with something else, it will fragment. But the fragments still have confined quarks. It's a very pretty picture. Like we can talk about it or you can study uh, quantum chromodynamics, uh, the theory of uh, uh, quarks and gluons. It's a very lovely theory. Any other questions? Sir, annihilation will not take place, sir, with uh, quark and anti-quark. Yeah, quark and anti-quark can annihilate, but since they don't uh, propagate freely, what can happen is the following. Imagine I have a, this is a proton. I also have anti-protons. Now, just as proton is made of quarks, anti-proton is made of anti-quarks. If I hit a proton and anti-proton uh, uh, onto each other, they won't annihilate because they are lumpy objects. Rather, the quarks inside one and the quark inside the other have a probability to annihilate. So proton-antiproton collision will create some new particles which might be missing one of the quarks and one of the anti-quarks. Those would have annihilated. So the, the whole picture of particle creation, annihilation, uh, particle, antiparticle, pair production, everything works as long as you accept that they, anything, quarks or antiquarks, are always confined. So this process goes on, but it goes on at the sub-nuclear level. That's the point. Hmm. Sub-nucleon level, actually. Okay. That's the whole point. It's very thrilling and it's quite it's quite subtle, but it's very well understood. Now nobody has any doubt. This is not a speculation anymore. But in 1960s, you can imagine Gelman coming up with these predictions just based on group theory. And that's the fundamental point of my talk. By the way, my point is not that group theory can predict everything. My point is that from time to time in very important stages of physics, 
mathematical ideas gave a prediction which turned out to be correct later and in ways that even the inventor could never imagine for example gelman did not imagine that quarks are permanently confined uh, he didn't he didn't understand the whole story he just gave an idea and it took 10 years and many other people's works to figure out how that idea works but the point is that the idea had something solid in it and that something is really really true even today 50 years later okay so this part i'm going to be skipping i'm sorry about that uh but i'm not going to skip the section on black holes because it's my favorite section so in the last 5 to 10 minutes of the talk i will talk about this so as i probably you heard this long name schwarzschild which also is interesting because schwarzschild in german means actually black shield so it's funny that the guy who invented black holes or discovered black holes has black in his name um he wrote this paper uh, saying on the gravitational field of mass points in einstein's theory what he did was to find a vacuum solution of einstein's general theory of relativity and it was supposed to describe the fabric of space time or the metric of space time in a vacuum uh, outside any body it applies even to the earth it describes the metric of space time outside the earth but the solution has a peculiar property that deep inside there is a singularity of space time it's a place where space and time become curved in a infinite way now for the earth that's not an issue because uh, the earth does not have a singularity of space time inside it i assure you and the reason is that the earth is not vacuum inside it's only vacuum outside it's not even vacuum outside its atmosphere but let's say outside the earth and its atmosphere there is vacuum that's where the solution applies inside you can't say anything because uh, because the solution changes as you go inside the earth however uh, what's interesting is that you can form you can hypothetically form form space times which go inside this uh, so which are so small that the singularity becomes real and let me try to show you how that works this actually was not even in probably in schwarzschild's paper but in 1939 oppenheimer and snyder argued that if i take spherically symmetric matter bit idealized and i press it in and it collapses then or it collapses under its own gravitational force then it could collapse to something which has a singularity and the singularity is covered by a horizon so i think i might have a diagram on the next page uh, no i have this artist conception of a black hole uh, this solution was then interpreted as a space time from which nothing can escape and named a black hole now i'm skipping over a long uh, history which involved a lot of people including john wheeler i think who gave the name uh, black hole uh but it all started from an innocent solution of schwarzschild and the observation of oppenheimer and snyder that under collapse such black holes can actually form and they will have a horizon which is a one way membrane such that uh, anything which goes in even light cannot come out and they will have a singularity now in the physics community this these discoveries were treated as mathematical curiosities first thing is that almost all physicists know very little about general relativity it's a very specialized field and its equations are very special they are quite difficult and you won't find most physicists in particle physics or condensed matter physics or any other nuclear physics would know these equations and the fact that these equations are so beautiful and they predict something and that something should be real was ignored or neglected by most people now a few people in the 60s particularly people in the field of astronomy and including fred hoyle who was particularly brilliant proposed that maybe some newly discovered objects called quasars or quasi stellar objects which are actually pulsars they may be black holes but even if a few quasars are black holes it was not clear that black hole formation is a generic process maybe by some random event a few black holes were formed uh, in the galaxy or in other galaxies but it was not clear how general the phenomenon is now this phenomenon this problem was revisited in 1964 by a young british mathematician called roger penrose 
and uh, i'll show you his first one of his first papers it's called the generalized inverse for matrices it studies matrix algebra and how to define an inverse even if the matrix has determinant zero it's a generalized definition okay now he also developed something else with his father the famous impossible triangle and staircase you might have seen these figures this is a figure that you can draw but it doesn't have any reality you can't really make this figure obviously because the junction the perspective of the three junctions just doesn't fit similarly here is a staircase where you climb up 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 and you come back to the same point so this is called the impossible staircase and uh, these drawings actually influenced uh, and in, in turn influenced and were influenced by the dutch artist escher you might have seen uh, his famous painting called ascending and descending which shows these people or soldiers whatever they might be uh, one or set walking continuously ascending in this clockwise pattern and the other set continuously descending in this anti clockwise pattern so what is this this is recreational mathematics and it's art trying to highlight the beauty of of perspective and mathematics and so on well what does it have to do with physical reality uh, pretty much nothing this is even impossible it's just a kind of tricky uh, a kind of tricky idea which is very pretty but then uh, not long after that penrose published a paper studying the time development of collapsing objects as predicted by einstein's equations and he showed that under suitable initial conditions when an object collapses it can form what is called a closed trapped surface and i think that closed trapped surface is this ring which you see here so this is a kind of um, uh, simplified diagram where your surface is not uh, a, a sphere that's collapsing but a circle just to reduce the dimensionality to visualize and when the circle goes below some size uh we get here and here in this region it's trapped and now it inevitably has to proceed to a singularity so his result was once a closed trap surface forms collapse is inevitable no matter how much the object is perturbed that means that this object will form a black hole after it passes the time when this surface has formed even though at that time it's not a black hole and it's not obvious uh that you couldn't stop it by hitting it with a hammer disturbing it throwing something into it pulling something out of it none of that will work collapse is inevitable and that was very beautiful because it showed that the formation of black holes is a some sort of inevitable process given certain initial conditions now most physicists today i just told you this would be unable to follow his paper even though it was only 3 pages long the this diagram which is a classic in general relativity today is taken from that three page long paper but the conclusion was very simple he says after a certain time even if the object deviates from spherical symmetry it cannot prevent space time singularities from arising so remember oppenheimer and snyder showed that if something collapses in a spherically symmetric way it will form a horizon and a singularity but what he said was that supposing it's it's fairly spherical in the beginning but after some time i hit it or something collides with it that isn't going to prevent the singularity from arising so what he really had proved was the generic nature of black holes they are quite generic therefore a variety of stars will collapse into black holes which will all have singularities of space time at their core and which will all have horizons now the horizon idea came a little bit later actually uh even though some examples were known uh, and even schwarzschild original solution has the property of horizon penrose felt that well having a singularity of space time where curvature diverges is not very physical and the laws of physics would break down if somebody was allowed to encounter a singularity and then come back okay then you could not at all predict any future course of events if something passes through a region where some physical quantity is infinite after that it just becomes unpredictable and the laws of physics will break down but he said it won't matter if the people who go to the singularity are never allowed to come back to us and that will happen if every singularity is inside the horizon now in short shell solution the singularity is inside the horizon but penrose proposed cosmic censorship which is the claim that 
generically singularities are always inside horizons. And in 1970, Hawking and Penrose joined forces and gave a general theory of singularities that also applies to the Big Bang in cosmology. That Big Bang thing was Hawking's extra contribution. Penrose was thinking of collapsing objects. Hawking was thinking that if we look at the universe back in time, it seems to collapse to a point. Now, 50 to 55 years after Penrose's work, black holes have gone from being a mathematical curiosity to the most common objects in the universe. And this is a quote, I think, from the Nobel uh, Prize citation. As you know, he got the Nobel Prize uh, last year. They are estimated to be at least 100 billion supermassive black holes in, this, in, in the universe, okay, uh, with many of them in this galaxy, but then many in every galaxy and these are only supermassive black holes that is those with the masses of a million to a billion times the mass of the sun there are there is at least one supermassive black hole thought to be at the center of each galaxy but there are also stellar and intermediate mass black holes so stellar means its mass is around the mass of the sun or say three to four times that intermediate would be you know a few 50 100 thousand a time or maybe 10,000 times the mass of the sun, less than a million. And these are everywhere. The mass is of, you know, 40, 50 times the mass of the sun. That's actually measured now. And partly because of this and partly because of the experiments of Gez and Genzel, who actually did astron astronomical observations where they discovered these supermassive ones, uh, much before LIGO discovered these, uh, that uh, confirmed that these intermediate mass ones are also there. So the Nobel Prize went to these three people. Penrose got half of it, one by two, you see here, for the theory. And essentially, all that theory is in that three-page, three hard-to-understand mathematical paper. Everything else did after that was kind of working on the details of that paper. But the basic idea of closed trapped surfaces was there. And these two people uh, shared the other half of the prize uh, for the uh, astronomical observations, which made Penrose's prediction into a confirmed reality. Okay, so this is the bulk of my talk. Sorry, I'm a little over time, but if I can have two minutes, I'll just give you a few thoughts and I'll end. So here are my thoughts. Then you can ask questions on any part of the talk. Physics is not just a directory of objects and behaviors. It's an organized and highly universal structure. The fundamental interactions, electromagnetism, weak and strong interactions and gravity, as far as we know, are the same in all parts of the universe. And they're all described by highly mathematical theories. Well, for the first three, these are called gauge theory. And for the last one, it's called Riemannian, pseudo-Riemannian geometry or Einstein's gravity. Now, Wigner marveled at the fact that mathematical thinking plays a sovereign role in physics. My own feeling is that there is a set of universal laws of physics of which the standard model and general relativity are special cases and they may even be approximate. The idea of such universal laws, first of all, these laws should be based on some symmetry principles because standard model and general relativity certainly are based on very, very deep symmetry principles. You may have heard of the principle of equivalence or you may have heard of SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 gauge symmetry. These are all symmetry principles. Now, the universal laws can, if they exist, can be called unified theory or final theory or string theory. Uh, but we're not sure, so let's just call them universal laws. A very beautiful book which I recommend is called Dreams of a Final Theory by Weinberg. Now, nature's template for physical reality seems to be based on these laws and phrased in the language of mathematics. Such laws typically have a wide applicability, and this explains why sometimes a law is proposed in particle physics, but it works in condensed matter physics. Actually, the Higgs mechanism, which I couldn't discuss today, was proposed by Anderson in condensed matter, and it works there, and it also works in particle physics, and it's the same mechanism. The details are different because this is materials and this is vacuum, but it's the same mechanism. Sometimes one of the uh, applications doesn't work. For example, axions and Majorana fermions don't seem to exist in particle physics, but they exist in materials. That can be true. 
This perspective says that research on universal laws can be more effective in the long run than research targeted on a specific physics problem. Without the work of, say, Wilczek, Witten, uh, and Witten on axions and uh, dions, uh, people who study topological insulators might not have understood uh, the phenomena that they were seeing there. This reminds us of an old story. Von Röntgen discovered X-rays uh, while he was trying to understand basic laws of nature. He was an experimentalist, but his discovery of X-rays did more for medicine than all the medical researchers of his time put together. So, uh, just throwing out these historical facts, I don't have any clear prediction for the future, but I think uh, this should amuse you and you should think more about it. Now, there's a slight puzzle, which is that, uh, and I, I'm way over time, I should end now. Uh, Philip Anderson, who passed away recently, would disagree with me powerfully. He says that complex systems don't obey any fundamental laws that you people find for standard model or for uh, gravity. The laws governing con complex systems are sometimes universal. There are examples which I've shown you like topological insulators, BCS theory, but not always. In biology, there don't seem to be any laws that use the language of mathematics in an essential sense, as far as we know. And so I'll give you this uh, very funny quote, uh, uh, what Gelfand said, Eugene Wigner wrote a famous essay on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in natural sciences. He meant physics, of course. There's only one thing which is more unreasonable than the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in physics, and this is the unreasonable ineffectiveness of mathematics in biology. So it's a very deep, puzzling question. Uh, maybe biology of the future will be different. Maybe it will use mathematics. Maybe it won't. We really don't know. But uh, it seems that when it comes to physics, what we really understand as physics, that's where mathematics uh, has a very spectacular uh, impact, uh, which is an impact on real things. It's not just an impact on paper, but on real observable phenomena. So, uh, okay, I'm going to skip over this because I think I'm very much out of time. And maybe I will uh, end with these three nice quotes. Um, and you can read them yourself. Thank you very much. Yes, okay, I'm done. Yeah. yeah, we may have some questions. If someone has questions, you can uh, unmute your mic and uh, ask it. Sir, what about theory of everything? Theory of everything is just words, you know. Actually, uh, everything was a bad choice. Let's ask the question like this. Uh, could we have a theory of all fundamental interactions? Electromagnetic, weak, strong, nuclear, and gravitation. Well, right now we don't have one theory of all four, but we do have a theory of three of them. And the standard model of particle physics is a very good theory of electromagnetism, weak and strong interactions. It's a perfect theory. It, has, it agrees with all known experiments in this. Of course, it doesn't predict everything. First of all, it doesn't predict gravitational phenomena. But secondly, it doesn't tell us about materials. Thirdly, it doesn't tell us about biology. So people got all worked up when this word everything was used because everything sounded as if they were talking about all phenomena in the universe, everything we know. But that's not what was meant when the word theory of everything was, when that phrase was coined, they meant theory of all the fundamental interactions. And that idea is still alive and is probably correct. I don't see any reason why a fundamental theory of all fundamental interactions shouldn't exist. We don't know what it is. But uh, there's no reason why it shouldn't exist. But if it exists, it certainly won't explain what is a cat or what is a dog or what is a plant. I don't expect that that theory will immediately explain to you what are complex systems. Can you give us your opinion about the hierarchy of inter interactions, actually? Something about the anthropic principle, like why? Uh, things are made in certain uh, manner. Yeah. Like, so, what can be your opinion? Yeah. So, anthropic principle is the idea that there is no one basic law of physics because there can be so many. See, even within standard model, we have chosen the standard model to be the way it is, 
partly mathematically and partly because of uh, experiments which tell us uh, that uh, there are three colors of quarks and uh, there is doublet of leptons and so on. So we have SU3 cross, SU2 cross, U1 as the symmetry. But somebody else might propose a different standard model which has a different group. Okay. Why did nature choose this group? Now, one view is that, well, that's just the choice and there's not going to be any explanation why the group is SU3 and not SU156. Another view is, well, maybe there are many universes and in each of them, the group, the gauge group of nature is a different one and we happen to live in the one uh, where the gauge group is SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. And because that is the value of the, because that is the group and the masses of particles are what they are, therefore the conditions are correct for life to exist and that's why we are here. So in a universe where there's some different gauge group, the conditions may not be okay for life to exist and nobody would be studying that universe. It's a, it's a way of thinking about things, but it's not very satisfying because it um, compels you to imagine the existence of other universes which are not connected to ours. You know, it can happen because in the evolution of the universe, space times can split off and become causally disconnected. And that might be satisfying to people for various reasons. Uh, but another view in physics, which I still think is good is, we don't want to know why the gauge group is SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. Just tell us what is the correct standard model, which includes all the known interactions, including gravity preferably in a unified way. If you find one, maybe just simplicity is the criterion. Nature just chose the most simple one. Or we'll worry about that problem later. So anthropic principle seems um, a way to understand when there are many, many options, why one only one of them is realized in our world. And well, I have nothing more than that to say. Thank you, sir. Uh, one last question uh, may I ask? That, please, please. Uh, yeah, what's your opinion about the big bounce which is going on? Uh, uh, because which is a new thing, the new theory about in cosmology. And uh, since uh, uh, Professor Penrose is uh, also working on that, I heard that. What's your opinion about the bouncing what? cosmology? Bouncing cosmology. Well, the, you see, bouncing cosmology is quite an old idea. The idea is this, the universe is expanding right now. Uh, and it has been expanding as far back as we can see. So we can see light signals from very far away. And they confirm that those signals came from very much far in the past. So they confirm that far in the past, the universe was much smaller. That means things were much closer. The same objects were closer because the metric of space time was literally smaller. If you extrapolate that back right to the beginning, you may reach a point where everything comes to one crunch, the singularity that we call the Big Bang. But extrapolation is extrapolation. Nobody knows that extrapolation is a good thing. It might happen that after contracting in the past, the universe again expands. Okay, so that's a bounce. That means the direction of expansion or contraction may change at some time. For example, now it's expanding, the expansion may slow down, come to a halt, and then the universe may start contracting. Okay. Now, there's no experimental evidence that the universe expansion is slowing down. On the contrary, it seems to be speeding up as far as we know. So it's not obvious that there will be a crunch. Now, this bouncing cosmology you're talking about, if it's something recent, I don't know, probably I don't even know what it is. But the general idea of bounce is just the idea that a universe could expand for some time, then contract for some time. This is perfectly possible. It depends on the matter content of the universe, how much matter there is, and then you have to solve Einstein's equations for that. Uh, wouldn't that be a problem like conservation of information or something like conservation of entropy? uh because of contraction mm. again i don't want to comment on that i must say that uh, you know these are all nice and interesting speculative ideas but what i've talked about today nothing that i've discussed today is speculative everything i've discussed in the talk is real serious history with real experimental observations and my conclusions at the end are not about the details of the laws just that there's something in the laws which is more universal than the application, that is the structure of the laws, which is mathematical, 
suggests that they are tailor made not only for uh, physics of empty space that is elementary particle physics uh, but also physics of materials which is a totally different physics okay it seems that laws of physics the way they are tailored they can apply in many different contexts that is the point i wanted to make so i am not any expert on on uh, on on cosmological evolution so I, i i think you could get somebody who actually knows more about cosmology to address your questions about bounces and entropy thank you very much sir uh, can i ask a question please go ahead uh so sunil you said that uh, uh, we, there is this unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in physics uh, and, which, uh, how are you yeah i'm good yeah uh do you think the, the reason why it is not so effective in biology maybe because biology is not in uh, i don't know i should not use the word nascent but a stage where it is not like we we do not ask the question why so much in biology right i mean we yeah, right. don't know how yeah maybe, you know when we reach at that intricate level of discussions where do you think it may be still effective there it may be. just it may be uh, my knowledge of biology is so poor but i agree with you it is mostly about how questions and uh, you know biology i mean living materials uh, require quite a complex organization of stuff to happen right uh, just one a few electrons and a few protons are not going to be living on the other hand uh, this living characteristics they are only now being explored actually if you see how much soft condensed matter has developed in the last 10 20 years molecular with molecular motors and all kinds of now intermediate size materials being studied which are like you know biological but not particles maybe in another uh, two or three decades biology will turn into a more of a exact science yeah because i'm very intrigued with, uh, with the the things that work in condensed high energy and whatever hmm. it may be possible that a very large system like a like biology may also have some of the things in yeah, very well i mean uh, this is for you know people, all of you people who are here at the talk to do i mean uh, this is this is exactly what uh, you know one should think about in the future and one reason why <coughs> i feel that biologists like to hire uh, people with physics training into biology is that physicists bring with them this quantitative understanding of fundamental interactions and fundamental principles and i think uh, at some point this training can become more and more useful in biology maybe it's already starting yeah thanks a lot sumi thank you dipshi very very nice talk yeah thanks thank you so much thanks for coming yeah yeah can i ask please yeah so actually uh, first of all thank you uh, for very beautiful talk but uh, my question is little bit uh, in this ground so mathematics uh, it helps us to discover new physics theory or uh, something but on the foundation in mathematics side there is some problem as we know from uh, gödel's theorem or uh, turing theorem mm-hmm. so what is your feeling that it will impact physics in those uh, limited uh, limitation in mathematics yeah that's a good question but again it's uh, you know it's in a level of depth much more deep i should emphasize that the mathematics that uh, for example penrose used even though it's very difficult it's not uh, it's not it's not super deep from the mathematical point of view i mean there are some differential equations uh, for some variables and that's basically it yeah. okay it's very diffi- of course penrose in fact only yesterday i read this that penrose has been saying that he So, uh, tries to visualize things he imagine the physics he could he could look at those equations and imagine the physics and think about uh, various processes and so on which mm-hmm. mathematicians typically don't do yeah. but so, 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 so if we look in this way so in mathematics some question we know that that will remain undecidable mm-hmm. but is it the case that in physical world also some question about nature will remain undecidable okay. if we use this mathematical language that should be the case it could be but but what is your feeling that in nature some question is always remain undecidable uh, it could be i mean uh, the point is that uh, the the evolution of physics teaches us that we should not take uh, predictability of nature uh, too seriously anyway because first thing quantum mechanics destroyed the normal predictability and made it uh, statistical 
quantum in terms of expectation values. Then uh, singularities uh, in black holes also destroy predictability of laws of nature unless cosmic censorship is true. Then information loss paradox, which I didn't discuss today, says that uh, laws of physics may not have predictability because information can be destroyed, entropy can be reduced. Now people say that's not what happens, but it was a fear. So every time you study nature more, you realize that a predictability of nature, it's still alive, it's still there, but it's always under some risk. Whether it will finally fail or it will survive, that is for future generations to decide. So, in that case, doesn't it challenge this belief that there should be some universal laws? Or, uh, yeah, it does. It does, but you know, it may challenge it, but it may not be right, and the belief may be right. We don't know. I, I certainly, I don't know that universal laws are a fact. I just believe that it's a likely possibility, and also I like that possibility because. Uh, um, it, it encourages us more to do physics. If physics is going to break down, we may feel a bit discouraged to do it. Yeah, thank you for beautiful talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we have. Uh, how okay. do we perceive the particles in uh, multi dimension like uh, 10D, uh, 8D? You said no, sir. Mm. No, 8D I never said. 10D and 8D, are, those are not dimensions of space. Huh? Those 8D and 10D are representations of SU3. And they are a mathematic. They are a, they describe a mathematical space. Which, by the way, the space is not also 8D or 10D. The space is a set of discrete points in 2D, as you saw. I was drawing diagrams of the plane. There is no 8 or 10D space in my talk at all. Hmm. Okay. I want to emphasize that Gelman's idea was that the representation space of SU3 representations which is known to be 8 or 10 dimensional. That's a mathematical dimension, nothing to do with space. It's just a dimension of a of an abstract space in mathematics. Hmm. So that kind of thing uh, predicts a certain number of particles, but those particles are all in our physical universe. They're all seen in every experiment, in every uh, collider at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. They're really in our space, three space, one time dimension. There are theories which involve higher space-time dimensions, but that's for another talk. Uh, maybe if you're still interested a year or two years from now, I can give you that talk. Okay, sir. Yeah, sir, we have some questions from a YouTube audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Anirban both asked which theory is correct, string theory or loop quantum gravity, because both are mathematically correct. Uh, no, no, correct. You know, you're, you're using correct in too many ways. Correct, a correct theory should be something which explains natural physical phenomena. Mathematically, both may be correct. Whether they explain physical phenomena exactly as written, that we don't know at all. And I'll remind you, you know, uh, it turns out that axion electrodynamics is correct, but not in the way that we'll check thought. It's correct in a different context, which is uh, topological insulators. So similarly, any of these theories may be correct in some context or in some other context, we don't know. Right now, we don't know about either one. So, mathematical correctness does not tell you where it applies. It just tells you that these are interesting, you should look at them. That's the, the important thing is, when there is a mathematically good theory, you should look at it. You may find it useful. That's really the bottom line. Yeah, thank you, sir. The next next question by the same person. Some mathematical theories have no physical significance till now. Is this a fault of physics or mathematics? Nobody's fault. There can be all kinds of theories which have no physical uh, significance because physics is about nature. Nature has limited possibilities while mathematics has unlimited possibilities. Okay. As far as we understand, nature has some limited possibilities. For example, uh, the number of uh, space and time dimensions that we observe are 3 and 1. You can imagine them 5 and 4, but uh, it will be very difficult to have a theory of physics which has many times. People have tried that, but uh, it makes sense, some sense in mathematics, but doesn't make any sense in physics. So there will always be mathematical theories which don't make any sense in physics. If they are really well, well motivated, they may have application in physics at some stage or the other. And looking at it is good because if you want to be a creative scientist, 
you should have some box of tools that you might use and for that mathematical theories are very good box of tools okay but you know you have a tool box doesn't mean every tool will be useful if you are trying to fix a leaking pipe maybe you need a spanner not a screwdriver you can't say that your toolbox is going to always be useful for everything yeah so we have devang agnihotri uh, the question is sir how to approach mathematics from a physical point of view i think yeah i think the answer to that is to base uh, you know you may of course in high sir people do take some mathematics courses even when they are doing physics major but by and large people learn that mathematics by learning the physics so when we teach quantum mechanics we teach the mathematics of hilbert space as part of that okay when we teach quantum field theory you have to learn certain things about distributions and so on when you teach gravity you have to learn certain things about differential geometry it comes in the package so when physics is taught the mathematical part comes along many people make a mistake saying that before i do any physics i master all of mathematics that's like saying that before i become a plumber i'll buy all the tools available on amazon.in not a good idea you should start with a few tools and buy more tools when you need them don't try to acquire all the tools at once because you don't know which tools you may need to do physics yeah thank you sir any more questions from the audience yeah the same to be no more questions it was a wonderful oh, thank you sorry i went a bit over time thank you very much you have been very good audience yeah no sir it's fine that was a really great talk and uh, we would like to thank all the audience here and uh, the physics department at icit tvm and uh, dr sunil mukhe for uh, accepting the invitation and presenting a wonderful talk we hope all of you had a very good time thank you okay thanks so i'll leave now bye bye yeah okay. yeah sure sir yeah okay. thank you sir thank you